And a very pleasant good evening to everybody. Welcome to Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Tom Heck. Paul Vanderwerf with me tonight. Paul, no stranger here to KZGN. Paul is uh, the outdoorsman, and that's his theme on Monday nights. Also a horticulture, uh, what I would call an expert. I don't think Paul's ever met a plant that uh, he can't contain or get rid of weeds or do something else, and uh, he's your go-to guy for that. But something else about Paul that maybe a lot of you uh, don't realize, Paul, is uh, when it comes to sports, a lot of history uh, in his head. And he can run down facts, figures, and people from the, the 80s and probably before that. And we're going to pick his brain a little bit tonight, and we're going to talk about how things were here back in the 1980s and maybe back even in the 70s. Paul was a member of uh, a couple very good basketball teams here at Burroughs. But, Paul, let's just start with uh, a side that um, maybe those that uh, aren't the outdoors people uh, that don't get to see you that much. Uh, talk about your athletic side, what you did at, uh, in high school. And I know you're also a high school uh, sports official. So talk about your background in athletics a little bit. Right. I, actually, things I was doing in high school, I'm still doing today. Uh, I, I think it was my senior year in high school. I was just looking through some old paperwork. I was the assigner for the basketball officials for the rec league over at the base. And uh, that was uh, in 82, my senior year which we uh, had a, a great basketball run. We were the uh, CIF Southern Section Champions for 2A. And uh, we also played uh, baseball, all league for the Burroughs baseball team. Not quite as successful as far as the team uh, for our statistics, but still a whole lot of fun. And uh, it really uh, was just a culmination of growing up at China Lake on the base, which a lot of people did. Um, we moved here first in the late 60s, 68, uh, living in what we called Wary Housing after Senator Wary what we now call, I think, Cimarron Gardens right there uh, by the high school. And uh, I think just a lot of people kind of moved in and, and stayed, even though they thought they were going to be here for a year. They stayed here for years. And, and in looking back at it, there was a lot of us that, that stayed all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade and had a lot of siblings that were involved. And so uh, when I look back, say, at our basketball team, every player that I can think of either had a, a little bit older brother or a lot older brother. Some of, some of our players were kind of that kid that was maybe six or eight years younger than their nearest sibling. But uh, definitely that was a mindset that we just started playing ball uh, out in the yards when we were a little kid. I, I lived right across from the old dispensary. That whole neighborhood's torn down now. But at the end of Lordson Road, which I think now is a gate going out onto the ranges, uh, the original dispensary, at least the, the first one that I knew about, had a huge grass area and it was uh, actually my kindergarten birthday party. We played uh, wiffle ball out there. Uh, that's what the birthday party was. But I remember going out there in the, in the late 60s and uh, up to about 1970, had my dad hit fly balls where it was just a little pee up in the sky and I'd try to hit it and I'd uh, catch it and I'd miss it. It would hit me on the head or the arm and I'd, I'd start crying and I'd have to shake it off because my older brothers were still out there playing. And I think that's real typical of uh, that experience growing up on the base. Um, we were all in little neighborhoods and we'd move from one neighborhood to the other. Um, you know, just looking back at it, my next door neighbor was the Edmonds and Larry Edmond uh, probably uh, played varsity basketball in 1980, two years before me. But yet, uh, although we were playing maybe in first and second grade, um, I moved into a different neighborhood. And uh, I was up in what we called Snob Hill at the top of the hill where the the um, officers lived, and so Snob Hill was <laughs> was a, a different neighborhood with a little bit um, different experience. But I was a little bit older, and that worked out well too. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, a whole lot of history of sports. And you look at the great athletes; um, sometimes they excelled in one sport, sometimes it was multiple sports. We had China Lake sports run through the MWR, and then the Ridgecrest sports started to come up later. So we had China Lake Little League uh, right next to Murray, which now those fields have been destroyed. And we had Ridgecrest Little League, which was out in town, which at the time, the Kerr McGee fields were, were donated by the uh, plant in Trona, it was all dirt. They had no grass when they started. And so there was a great cross-town rivalry at All-Stars. But uh, typically, most of the other sports, our football was played at the, at the football field at Murray. And our uh, basketball, back then, we didn't have very many gyms. We had uh, Monroe, we had Burroughs, and we had the base gym. And uh, when I first started playing basketball, we didn't even have a, a youth center or a youth gym. We would uh, practice on the outdoor courts. I remember walking all the way down to what was the personnel 
office um, over kind of over by the admin building on the base and we would play on an outdoor court in between the buildings and uh, old Dave Wirtz and uh, Mr. Covert were the two coaches and I still remember that first year if I wasn't paying attention I'd have to run a lap and I ran quite a few laps <laughs> being an eight-year-old with the nine and ten-year-olds getting to play uh, that first year and then the big event was Saturday morning we get to play in the main gym there at the base and and that that gym is, has really been used a lot by the community when Saracoso first started they didn't have a gym and they actually played the college basketball games on the base and so uh, even uh, in high school if I wanted to watch a college game uh, we had Steve Parham and Lou Raymond which were great players from Chicago um, I think Steve, um, Lou Raymond I think was the the state's leading scorer back then and we would just go over to the base gym and little tiny you know seating a uh, very small gym but a great caliber of play uh, back in the day before we had what, what Saracosa was as far as sports is that was just a hill that we had to run for conditioning we would run up that hill it wasn't it was something you wanted to get over when, when you were done running the hill then that meant basketball season was starting we didn't have any housing uh, we didn't have any anything on the right side of the campus none of the ball fields the soccer field, the basketball gym, none of that was there. And so that was quite a bit different. But uh, it, it was great. It was, it was all you know when you're a kid. You're playing at the schools. The different schools would have um, challenges. We'd have V-Week would come over to Richmond and play basketball, and then we'd go over to V-Week and play softball. And then uh, the next year we would, we would do it again. And, and that was just a lot of fun. You know, you look at the history, because back then the school districts were different. China Lake School District was, was not part of Sierra Sands. There was the Kern County School District. And so uh, I think it was around 74 or so, 74 to 76, somewhere in there, that um, the community said, okay, we want more control of our local schools. And they said, let's create our own school district. And then they had a contest, okay, what are we gonna name it? So everybody was writing in their names. And uh, Sierra Sands was, was the name that came out through the community, through that contest. And so that um, really worked to try to get that money locally. But then again, without having that funding base on the base, that's always been a challenge, uh, whether it's property taxes in town for the regular infrastructure or for the schools. Uh, we're still seeing okay, after Paul, all these Hold years, that Murray. thought, and we'll get right back. We've got to take a quick break. Don't go away. More from Paul Vanderwerf right here on Ridgecrest Talk on this Tuesday night. And welcome back. If you just tuned in, I'm Tom Heck with Paul Vanderwerf. It's Tuesday night. Our theme is sports. And Paul tonight kind of going a little bit of the history of sports and recreation in, in the city of Ridgecrest and even Trona and right outside the IWV area. But, Paul, let's go back and let's take football. Give us your earliest memories of high school football um, in Ridgecrest, maybe as a, a junior high elementary student going to the games and um, you mentioned that the old high school used to be over at Murray, and that's where the stadium was at the time. And you can go, still see the old light standards, the cement foundations that are there. Now, I love history. I love going and, and talking about and seeing old sites. But let's start with football. And you mentioned that Trona at one time was actually um, the bully. And we were the ones that uh, had to kind of be second fiddle to them. Right. I was actually talking with the retired dentist over there in Trona, and he was kind of, you know, reminding me that back in the day, Trona was the bully, and, and Burroughs was kind of the small guy on the block. And that's quite a difference compared to today, where Trona is even losing its population from what it's been just a few years ago. Um, really, my earliest memory of, of football would be the Pee Wee football, is there at Murray. Um, there's another Larry Bird that was in town. We had Larry Bird, the basketball coach, but this was Larry Bird, the football coach, and actually um, very involved with the football program. He had a number of kids, his son Larry Bird and Joe Bird. I think Joe was a year younger than I was. And uh, I, I recall, you know, the Pee Wee football being played there. In high school, the real buzz was uh, back when the, the, I think it was the Blanche brothers, Amos and Steve, and uh, McDowell. Yeah, it was, was 75, it? 76 right in there. Yeah. They just had some real talent. Now, that's, that was Little League time for me. 
and, and Little League at China Lake meant you were there every night whether you played or not because a foul ball was a race to get a snow cone. If uh -huh. you got the foul ball, you turn it into the snack shack for a treat. And so uh, every night we were out doing something. Um, we were practicing. If you played basketball on Saturday, you were practicing Monday through Friday. If you were playing Little League baseball, you might have two games a night and you were practicing the other three nights. So you were out playing every night. Football at the high school, um, I'd go occasionally, but I really, since I wasn't playing football, I really didn't pick up, you know, I had certain players that I liked, certain years that, that I enjoyed certain games, but it, it wasn't as strong of a memory um, outside of, you know, certain individuals. It's kind of like when you have a winning season, you kind of remember the season, but then you have certain individuals, you know, the Tungits, the Bachmans, um, you know, even Mike Waters was around my, my age, and he was one of these crazy uh, uh, special teams guys that just went out there with a lot of heart. And, and played in the, in the pro level for just a little bit. We had, um, I know uh, Dave Cordell's brother, so you, I kind of look at it from a perspective from my age. Uh, Dave was a little bit older than me, and of course his older brother, well, I believe was All-American at Fresno State as a defensive back. Mm -hmm. So you have these individuals with great talent and with a lot of success, but uh, that, that was the Lily White years. Verla Lily White was the athletic director. Big guy, his knees were kind of shot. I think he played for the Niners professionally, and. and uh, seeing him coming through at high school is he kind of moved slow but he still uh, got a lot of respect from the from the athletes as well as everybody there at the school uh, football uh, was really that was my conditioning time for sports so i was a basketball player i was this close to being a football player my friend and i had called uh coach rosseth um, just as they were starting their their season our senior year we called and we were going to go out and play and, and I, uh, his wife had answered the phone, and, and we asked for coach, and he wasn't there. And, and we were kind of hesitant because neither one of us had played varsity football. And as it ended up, uh, we kind of talked ourselves out of it because we were worried about the cost. It's like, how are we going to afford you know, the physical, the cleats, uh, all the meals on the trips, all the things that go into that. And that, that's a real cost. I mean, that was, uh, it seemed like every time you turned around, there was something else you had to pay for whether it was your, uh, your bag or your shoes. Um, I remember I, I played varsity sports, but I never had a varsity jacket. I couldn't see the sense of spending the money on a varsity jacket when I'm always asking for money or this or that, or as I got older, I was working part-time to get money to, to pay for some of that stuff. And, and we were actually pretty fortunate in looking back at it. I think a lot of the families that grew up on the base had um, those regular jobs on the base where, you know, I went from kindergarten through 12th grade with uh, probably half of my class uh, started at Richmond. And then if you look at the 12th grade at Burroughs, at least half those kids were still graduating at Burroughs together from my kindergarten class. And I think a lot of communities, you don't see that. But with that, um, you know, there were some kids that, that were uh, in different situations where they couldn't afford to play. They were good athletes, but it's just like, you know, I just don't have time between school and having to work I'm not able to play sports this year. And, and so um, I was kind of grateful, I think, looking back at it, that I was able to play as, as well as a lot of the others. I had a, a, a real scare in eighth grade. I had a bone tumor. I was told I'd never walk again. Jeez. And so I went from uh, probably traveling five times a game the end of our eighth grade year because I kept jumping off my foot to uh, in ninth grade, I didn't play any sports. Um, I took the whole year off. They wanted to put me in adaptive PE, and we kind of argued about that. And I was able to get a waiver from the ninth grade PE, as active as I had been. And that's actually when um, Carol Hape, Carol Hape was um, running the youth basketball, youth sports on the base for a number of years. And the transition at that time is instead of being in the main gym, they had a grocery store on the base that everybody shopped at called the shopping bag. And that's where the um, exchange is now, right next to the theater. And what used to be the library is now the... Um, I think it's like an enlisted uh, hangout club now. But the shopping bag, the, the civilians would shop there. This was before even uh, Albertsons was built in town. And on the side was a big Quonset hut that was the uh, place you would get your gardening and your fertilizer and stuff like that. Well, right around 75, they uh, closed that down and they made that available to the youth services. And Carol Hape coordinated that. Um, parents came in, they put tile on the whole floor and put the, the lines for two basketball courts end to end. And so you'd walk in the middle and you'd have a basketball court on one side and a basketball court on the other end. And uh, a lot of slipping and sliding on a tile floor, but uh, 
we had a great time playing basketball in there. I, I think it was 75 was the first year. It was about when I was about 11 years old. And uh, it wasn't until after high school that they actually built a youth center that has a gym in it, which we still have today. I think they call it Castle X uh, over in that same area, just within a block of where the old uh, annex was, what we would call our youth center. Everything switched around so much. The, the base gym, you used to enter in the front. Now you enter at the side. Uh, what's the MWR division office used to be the youth center when I was a kid. We used to go in there and shoot pool, uh, ping pong, and had a, a little youth center there. And, and then that all moved over uh, Let me stop by the here. ball diamonds. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to finish with a, that thought. We'll go right into some basketball. Back after this timeout. And welcome back. If you just tuned in, I'm Tom Heck, Paul Vanderwerf. This is Ridgecrest Talk. Our theme is sports. And Paul, you might know Paul from Monday night. He's kind of the outdoor expert and horticultural uh, guru in the IWV. But tonight he's uh, kind of refreshing our memory and uh, maybe educating us on how things were back in the day here in the IWV when it comes to high school sports and recreation. And in our last segment, I want Paul to talk about basketball because basketball was a, a great, talented sport here in the early 1980s. Larry Bird, a legendary coach, was uh, the guy that led them to a couple of championships. Paul, a member in, uh, on one of those teams. Paul, take us through Burroughs basketball. Well, you know, I, I sat out my freshman year with that injury, and so I didn't play. And, and we had come off an eighth grade year at Murray where we were basically the county champs, a real strong program coming up into high school. And uh, as I recall, we had uh, Frank Mazur running the freshman basketball. I think he's in Europe now. We kind of all still stay in touch after all these years. Coach Sedios uh, was on the staff, and he's just passed away the last few years. And then we had uh, uh, Robert Campbell was still in college, so Bill Campbell was on the staff with Coach Bird. And uh, as I came into the program, I'd kind of been involved in the younger age, but by the time I was a sophomore, nobody knew who I was. And so I remember getting on the JV squad originally, uh, 24 guys were in practice. I didn't even get in in practice to get in and scrimmage with the other guys. I was one of those last four guys. So I just stood there watching and biding my time. And I think one of the real keys um, was a sense of urgency and this commitment that the coach had for his program, Coach Bird, and of course um, all the other coaches that tied in with that for basketball. Um, we had um, certain things that we did, like the three-on-three -three basketball which develops um, fundamentals and, and uh, brings people together. So I was a captain my sophomore year, and I picked guys for this three-on-three -three ball, which was actually played during baseball season. I picked guys that weren't necessarily known as athletes, but they came from athletic families. You know, we had some guys that were just, you know, like uh, Jesse Marino. The guy could probably shoot a full quarter and make it half the time, but he was really known for baseball and golf. Uh, but uh, his, his little sister Elaine was also a good athlete. And that was typically where it is, is you'd have that. And so I remember playing three on three. We had uh, Tamaris out in town, who was a great hitter and home run hitter in, in Little League and Ridgecrest. But I picked his younger brother to play on my three on three. And of course, the Fowl family was a family I grew up with. Tony was older. And, and I picked uh, Tim, who was my age. And so we were playing on three on three with guys who weren't committed basketball guys, but these were from athletic families. And so I was able to bring them together and talk to them, and we won the three-on-three -three against much better teams. But it was kind of typical, I think, of growing up in that um, experience, is that we were all playing together, and, and I was picking these guys because I knew they had older brothers and they were tough. They were used to getting pushed around, and they, they weren't going to you know walk off the court and quit. And so uh, we had a lot of fun on the three-on-three. Um, I remember Coach Bird just really motivating us individually and as a group. Uh, my junior year, I, I kind of came out of nowhere, I think, to be able to be a backup on that team. And then, of course, the senior year, we won CIF. Um, but th there's just so many stories in there. Uh, going back to, uh, you know, I had, I think on the 11 and 12-year-old team at the youth, I had two players that were on the, the varsity team that played with us. Uh, Scotty Fulton, who was what, who, who we called the Moose, 6'4", uh, bruiser that played tight end of the football team. Uh, Scotty in sixth grade was actually on the second string. He was uh, a little um, late in getting his coordination. 
and in elementary school, uh, he was our second string center. But by the time he was uh, in high school, by that senior year, you just didn't want to get in his way because he still had that little hitch step and it was not quite, it's almost like when you play basketball against a wrestler. You don't know exactly what the move's going to be. Scotty still had that little hitch step, which kind of threw people off. He wasn't real smooth, but he was just so big and strong that once he got that ball inside, it was over. And of course, we had um, that missing link, so to say, is a great story when Dalton Hayward transferred to the school, uh, uh, eventually becoming an All-American, but he jumped right out of the gym. And uh, there was, you know, still those older brothers. Richie Drake was captain of the basketball team. And then he had the younger brother, Danny Drake. And Billy Brown was a guard, and he had older brothers as well. And, and all those guys were people that we looked up to and played sports with. I was always playing with the kids a year or two older and, and trying to compete. But, you know, they were a little bit better. And so that, that brings you up as well. And so seeing those kids, you know, Steve Mott was, was a pretty big kid in high school. Um, and then for Dalton to come on campus and be able to compete and challenge with those seniors when I was like a, a freshman, sophomore, was quite a difference. And another thing that was different then is we had ninth through 12th grade at the high school, 7th, 8th at the middle school. It was the junior high. And my ninth grade year, they decided to put ninth grade the following year at the middle school. Mm -hmm. So when I was in 10th grade, we were the uh, youngest for the second year in a row. So we went through high school uh, just 10th, 11th, and 12th. Uh, my last three years, we didn't, we, the freshmen would, would stay at the middle school, and then they'd catch the bus over for the PE, the last class of the day. And, and I think um, in looking at that, it was better for us as ninth graders to be at the high school because the older kids were keeping us in line. And I think that's much better. The ninth grade is kind of a tumultuous year. Uh, we had other great athletes. Uh, Lacey Barnes, Lenora Barnes, she, uh, I think she even went to the Olympic level in the discus. Put you on the spot. Give me the, in your opinion, and there's a lot of good players, but in your view, give me the top three all-time Burroughs basketball players, you think. Top three? Yep. Um, just being a kid and growing up in the neighborhood, uh, Steve Nathan was a guy that I always respected. Um, I never really saw him play too much, but I'd hear the stories. And Steve played uh, probably around 77. He was probably about five or six years older than me. And, and over the years, I got to play with him at the base gym. And, and he would work out and exercise. And he'd come out and shoot. And um, he's just a good, it's, it's a good kind of person to have around. He's a good guy, and he's a good athlete. Um, Steve was one. Um, Got about uh, 40 seconds to. Turn. Yes, Steve was one that jumps out there. Of course, Daniel Means, who was a sophomore when I was a senior. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel did a lot after I left the school, um, but he definitely um, would be in the mix in there. And then that third one, just from my perspective, is I really enjoyed playing with Dalton. Uh, he, he'd just jump out of the gym, and he was a, a quiet leader by example. But uh, I'm sure there's been some since then that I'm not as familiar with. I was gone for some years in the mm -hmm. 90s. But, um, you know, really, you, when I was in high school, you could have went to every Burroughs high school basketball game and never see the team lose. We never lost in Burroughs, Jim. It just didn't happen. Our crowd was huge. The experience was just something different than what it is today. All right, Paul, appreciate your time. We're going to have to have Paul back. Just, we just got started. So appreciate you tuning in tonight. Uh, you can join us on Tuesday nights. I'm Tom Heck for Paul Vanderwerf, bidding you a very pleasant good evening.